A retro diving helmet appears. A pickaxe flies into the picture. Question marks appear above the helmet. Exploration explained. Students talking about deep sea mining. Episode 12. Legal status of the sea floor. Hi everyone. Now that we've had a look on all the different scientific sides of deep sea mining, we proceed to the social sides, or more so, the legal status of the deep sea floor. Who controls the deep sea mining? It's not like on land where states can decide where and how they mine, or is it? Are there any laws or public bodies who control deep sea mining? You will see. Since humankind has been traveling the oceans for thousands of years, the oceans have long been a subject to some kind of regulations. A world map is sketched and sailing ships are drawn in the Atlantic, Indian and the Pacific Ocean. In the 17th century, in times of international trading between the colonizers and colonial states, new sea routes and other developments, the first public law of the sea was established. It was called the Freedom of the Seas Doctrine or Mare Liberum. Lines are drawn through the ocean basins. In the Pacific, a horizontal line is drawn across the basin at about 30 degrees north and in the Atlantic, two lines are drawn through the basin between the USA and Europe and the USA and West Africa respectively. Text 1609 Mare Liberum This doctrine declared the seas as international territory, free for all, and states only had jurisdiction over a narrow belt surrounding their coastline. But barely 100 years ago, some nations came to express their concerns over the exploitation of mineral resources or coastal fish stocks. A fish swarm is added to the map at the southern tip of South America, as well as the threat of pollution and waste from transport vessels and oil tankers. An oil tanker spilling oil appears off the coast of South Africa. Some conferences were held, but nothing specific happened until the mid of the 20th century. Technological developments expanded the nautical range in which countries could detect and exploit natural resources. A map of the United States of America is outlined, and in the upper left corner, a photograph shows Harry S. Truman. So finally, the president of the USA, Truman, extended in 1945 the U.S. American Oceanic Jurisdiction to all the natural resources of its continental shelf, well beyond the coastal waters of the country. The edge of the continental shelf of the USA is indicated by a thin black line. Following that, in 1956, the United Nations held its first conference on the law of the sea, which resulted in four treaties two years later. Text United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. Below, the letters UNCLOS UNCLOS denote the abbreviation for the convention. Following the first UNCLOS, two further conferences were held. The last one came to conclusion in 1982 and resulted in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Text 1956 to 1958 UNCLOS 1 1960 UNCLOS 2 1973 to 1982, UNCLOS 3, also known as the Law of the Sea Treaty, which defines the rights and responsibilities of nations in their use of the world's oceans. This convention came into force 1994, replacing the four original treaties and has to date been officially approved by 168 states. Due to the promises of polymetallic nodule exploitation, the deep seabed was proposed to be a common heritage of mankind. This led to the establishment of the International Seabed Authority, with the responsibility to organize and control deep sea mining in international seabed areas. A seabed with several polymetallic nodules on it is drawn. Common heritage of mankind. Slowly, the heading International Seabed Authority fades in. The first achievement of this intergovernmental organization in 2000 was the adoption of regulations for prospecting and exploration for polymetallic nodules, with special provisions to protect the marine environment from any adverse effects. The authority followed this up by signing 15-year exploration contracts with seven private and public entities.
The international law of the sea precisely regulates who can explore where on the deep sea floor. The cross section of a coast is sketched. On the far left is the mainland. Past the coastline, the water depth steadily deepens towards the right. So, starting from the shore of a coastal state, this state has sole sovereignty, just like on land and its internal waters, over a zone of about 12 sea miles, or 22 kilometers. This is the so-called territorial sea. The body of water from the shoreline to a distance of 12 nautical miles of the shoreline, indicated by a vertical line, is marked sole sovereignty. A double-headed arrow indicates the range of the zone marked territorial sea, which falls under national jurisdiction. And the state sovereignty extends to the airspace above the sea, as well as to its seabed and subsoil. Here, the coastal state applies its own rules. After these 12 nautical miles, the contiguous zone starts. A second double-headed arrow, marked contiguous zone, is placed between the 12 nautical mile line and a vertical line situated at a distance of 24 nautical miles of the shoreline. Here, the state still has limited control and can still limitedly sanction breaches of its laws. Then follows the EEZ. A third double-headed arrow, marked Exclusive Economic Zone, is placed between the 12 nautical mile line and a vertical line situated at a distance of 200 nautical miles of the shoreline. The EEZ is defined by the UNCLOS as the Z-Zone over which a state has special rights regarding the exploration and exploitation of marine resources on the seabed and subsoil. And it includes the contiguous zone. The EEZ stretches out to 200 nautical miles or 370 kilometers and regulates the rights of a nation below the sea. However, the surface waters in the EEZ are already open to passage and the coastal state can't prohibit passage anymore, like in the territorial waters. Following the EEZ lie the international waters, on and below the surface. The remainder of the outlined water, beyond the EEZ, is marked international waters or high seas. The resources in the international seabed area do therefore not belong to individual states, but are defined as the common heritage of mankind and their benefits are to be shared equitably according to UNCLOS. Here it lies in the hand of the ISA to regulate the usage of the deep sea floor. It should ensure that the benefits from deep sea mining are shared between rich and developing countries and that only gained by those who can buy a mining license. If a state wishes to extract marine minerals for scientific or soon economic purposes from the international seabed area, it can apply for an exploration license. A ship sails the high seas and polymetallic nodules appear on the seabed beneath the ship. So, now that you've seen that the legal status of the deep sea floor is not so easily understood, you can investigate further with the links and information in the description box below. And if you have any questions, just type them in the comments. In the next episode, I will interview Professor Mats Lück, an expert for international sea law. And we will talk about recent developments in the legal status of the deep sea floor and the exploitation of deep sea resources. So stay tuned and see you in the next episode. References Entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica, authored by Robin Churchill. Law of the Sea, accessible via www.britannica.com slash topic slash law minus of minus the minus c online article published by the national institute for ocean science ifr emer law of the sea online article published by the national institute for ocean science ifr emer metallic mineral resources in the international area Online article published by Midas, Policy and Governance, accessible via www.eu-midas.net slash policy minus and minus governance. Publication by Maribus in 2014, World Ocean Review 3, Marine Resources, Opportunities and Risks. 
Chapter 4 Clean Production and Equitable Distribution Online article published by the United Nations Oceans and the Law of the Sea Accessible via www.un.org slash en slash global minus issues slash oceans minus and minus the minus law minus of minus the minus c Thank you to Tristan Schwartau for designing the logo, a student's project which has been developed in the framework of the Ocean Sustainability Master Course of Kiel University and Geomar Kiel under the supervision of Professor Dr. Martin Wisbeck and Dr. Franziska Werner, April to September 2020. Amelie Laute, Larissa Scholz, Ariane Tepas. The Exploration Explained logo appears.